Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's Sales Chalk Talk. Uh, I am so excited to be here with you. Mario Martinez Jr. coming in from the Bay Area, San Francisco, California. Beautiful sunny day today. And I am the host of Sales Chalk Talk. Uh, I am also a champion of social selling, as well as the CEO of M3 Junior Growth Strategies, a social selling training, uh, social selling sales. Wow, gee, I can't even get that out. Social Easy selling and sales training company. <laughs> there we go. This is, this is what I love about live television here. Yeah. Uh, this is great. I'm elated to be here with all of you guys. Uh, today's topic, I promise you, you are going to walk away with some amazing tips from these three amazing gentlemen. Things that you can literally take away and walk back to your business to help explode your sales pipeline. So let's review a few housekeeping items first. First, number one. This is a no death by PowerPoint webinar. Why? We are a 100% video based webinar. And the reason why I chose to roll out with this program just like this, because as a sales rep, I loathed, I hate it being killed slowly by sales presenters who wanted to kill us with PowerPoint. So I promise you on every show. There we go, Jeff, thank you. I promise you that this show, Sales Chalk Talk, will continue to always be a video-based webinar so that you can actually get some great information and talk to some great folks. Number two, we only bring passionate, amazing, fire-in-the-belly type speakers. Here's our policy. We have a no-dud speaker policy. <laughs> So expect some great things coming from Jim Cathcart, Mark Hunter, and Jeff Seeley. The bar has been set high because they know if you're a dud, we, 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 we uh, cancel you out. <laughs> so in any case, good. And then number three, this is a live webinar. So please, here's what I want you to do. We want you to engage with us through live tweeting. Take out your iPhones, take out your Androids. <clears throat> and use your computer and engage on uh, Twitter. Here's a couple rules that we asked you to follow with Twitter, um, a couple things. Number one, on every tweet that you put out, tag at M underscore three JR, at M underscore three JR, and use the hashtag sales chalk talk, sales chalk talk, uh, for anything that you publish uh, for today. And we will amplify that in a very significant way with our Twitter following. Uh, secondarily, if you're quoting Jim Cathcart, Mark, Mark Hunter, or Jeff Seeley, please, here are the handles that you would want to use for them. Write this down, take your pen and papers out. For Jim Cathcart, he will be putting this into the chat session right now, but it's at Jim Cathcart, C-A-T-H-C-A-R-T t at jim cathcart and he's putting that into the chat session right now as we speak if you want to get a hold or tweet something that uh mr jeff seeley has said it's jeffrey j-e-f-f-r-e-y b as in boy seeley s-e-e-l-e-y and he's also putting that into the chat session as we speak right now and last and final if you want to quote anything from mr mark hunter uh you want to use at the sales hunter at the sales hunter and uh, mark is also putting that into the chat window as we speak so let's move on into today's agenda first as customary uh we always start off every sales chalk talk with one social selling training tip uh that you can walk away with and leverage immediately so we'll do that right after uh, this uh, uh review of the agenda Second, we're going to introduce our panelists to you guys, and then we're going to get right into the meat of this webinar. And third, uh, we are going to field any questions that you may have. That having been said, there is a Q&A tab that you see right here on your screen. Take that Q&A tab and start pounding away on questions that you may want to ask. The speakers, <clears throat> as well as myself, excuse me, will be moderating that particular Q&A tab throughout this entire session. And as they're speaking, they will try to bring those questions in. But we also have time dedicated at the end of Sales Chalk Talk uh, to um, uh, go through and answer those questions. So let's not delay. Let's get into my one social selling training tip of the day before we get into some meat. Everybody do me a favor. Grab your mobile devices, iPhone, Android, iPads, whatever it might be. And please go to your LinkedIn application on your um, on your device, your LinkedIn application on your device. Uh, and here's what I'd like you to do. Uh, once you're on your LinkedIn application, there's a big white bar at the top. In that white bar, just go ahead and type in the name Mario Martinez Jr. 
Mario Martinez Jr. <clears throat> and hit search. You should hit my profile. Now, if we are not already connected, uh, then this is going to definitely apply to you. So, as you're looking at my particular, <clears throat> pardon me, as you're looking at my particular profile, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to um, hit the three little dots in the upper right-hand corner. The three little dots in the upper right-hand corner. And the second to the last option says follow. Click follow. All right, click follow. Now, after you've clicked follow, by the way, to get there, you look at my profile if we are not already connected. The three, bu three buttons in the top right-hand corner, click that. And uh, the second to the last option says follow, click follow. Now go ahead and hit your arrow back and you should be back on my profile. And uh, you can go ahead and hit the connect button. This is the only time that I will tell you, go ahead and feel free to connect with me without sending a personalized message. Why? Because we are friends already here on this webinar. That having been said, the follow button is a unique, interesting button. And what it actually allows you to do is it allows you to notify your particular buyer or prospect that you're interested in learning more about them. And it sends them a notification. And this is a great selling tactic, social selling tactic that you'd want to use with key leaders in your organization that you want to engage with and or let them know that you're interested in learning about their insights. So <clears throat> feel free to follow your buyers, especially key executives. They will be notified that you follow following them and they will probably likely come back to your profile to see, hey, who's this new guy or gal that's following me? Uh, if you're in Sales Navigator, click saving as a lead does not notify them that you're following them. So that's just two different things. And uh, if we're already connected, well, take that tip and t teach somebody else that exact same tip and help them advance their skill sets. All right. Cool. So that is the follow feature. That's my one social selling training tip. It works phenomenally well. Uh, buyers all the time when, we, when I click follow almost always come back to my profile, which is exactly what you want them to do. Come and take a look and come and shop you. Uh, and that's a very important um, uh, training lesson there for social selling. All right, now let's move on into today's session. You've been promoted from sales rep to CEO. Round of applause, good job, Yay. good job, you've been promoted. And, uh, Today's webinar, I am very excited about this. As salespeople, we consistently hear um, this message from our leaders. It's your business, own it. We also hear uh, from our sales leaders, make the decision. But at the same time, we also are, are challenged by our sales leaders to say, you can't do that. <laughs> uh, and as sales leaders, we verbalize a lot uh, this concept. Own it, it's your business, take control, do it. So in today's webinar, we wanna get the answer to the following four questions. Number one, what does it mean to be the CEO of your own sales business? Number two, why should you think of yourself as a CEO or a business owner? Number three, how do I transform my own individual thinking and actions to be a CEO of my own sales business? And number four, last and final, if you are a sales leader, how can you enable your direct reports to truly become this CEO of their own business. And here's what I like to talk about. <clears throat> in sales leadership as well as an individual contributor, uh, I took responsibility for my business. I owned that particular business. And if you are a salesperson right now and you've got a quota, let's just say your quota is a quarter of a million dollars, a half million dollar your business or a million dollar your business. If you were to ask any business owner, is a million dollar a year business a revenue? Is that a big business? Absolutely. Every business owner will say, heck yeah. So I want you thinking a little differently today throughout this session. And that is why we brought on these three amazing individuals. And so without any further ado, I want to introduce our first panelist to the show, Mr. Jim Cathcart, a very good friend of mine, Jim. You've also heard him, heard him earlier serenading uh, our, uh, our group this, uh, this morning. He'll tell you about his individual raw talent momentarily. But Jim Cathcart is the motivation expert. He's the author of 18, 18 books. I, I haven't even finished my first one, Jim, so hopefully I'll catch up to you one day. <laughs> and here's the thing about this one. This was pretty amazing. Uh, he is the only person in my uh, circle of influence that I know of, uh, and if there's anybody else that there's out there listening that is part of this, I'm sorry I didn't know, but the only person in my, in my circle of influence that has been inducted into the sales and marketing 
Hall of Fame. Uh, for pioneering, uh, for his work in pioneering um, the concept relationship selling. He's also an award-winning uh, professional speaker. He speaks all over the world uh, on concepts about um, do what needs to be done even when you don't feel like it. Um, and if you want more information from Jim, please visit relationshipselling.com, relationshipselling.com. So Jim- oh, better, better still, cathcart.com. Cathcart.com. Yep. Thank you very much, Jim. Welcome to the show, my friend. Did I miss telling the audience something about you? You did not. That, that was great fun, and I appreciate all the compliments. I mean, yes, there are things we could talk about, like uh, oh, my music, for example, but uh, relevant to this topic, I think we ought all, all ought to be considering ourselves a gathering of business owners who got together today to talk about how to grow our businesses. And, you know, years ago, I had a man, Doug, Doug McDonald, who was a senior sales trainer with Mass Mutual. And I was assigned to Doug's tutelage as a young sales trainer coming aboard with them back in the 1970s. And Doug said to me, Jim, he said, for the first five years in selling, you're going to be underpaid for how hard you work. But after that first five years, if you form the right habits, the right thinking, the right, right relationships, you'll be overpaid for the rest of your career for how hard you work. So it, it, it's all about effort. At first, the effort needs to be in forming the mindset and, the, and the, 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 not only thought patterns, but also behavior patterns that put you in the position to grow your business exponentially over time. And... This is a big deal, uh, not just in selling, but this is a big deal in society in general. The more people who wait to receive instead of thinking of initiating, the weaker our society gets. The thing that sets America apart from much of the rest of the world is our government is here for the people, whereas in most other countries, the people are considered to be there for the government or for the rulers. and. Uh, what sets us apart is our independent nature as a, as a society. You know, I, I look at me when I was, when I first started, I'm going to do a screen share. This will be amusing to your, to our attendees today. When I first got involved in the field of selling, I was in Little Rock, Arkansas, where I grew up back in the 1970s. And this is what I looked like. Okay. Share screen. There we go. Can you see that picture? <laughs> that fat guy right there was me in 1970 when I got married. You like the mustache? I love it. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's get rid of the fat guy. And this is me today because today I have the habit of being a mountain hiker. And I go trail running with a bunch of friends three days a week. And we climb some pretty substantial mountains. You can see the people going up this one. And uh, we do about six miles round trip before sunrise each morning. We start out like this, you know, on a dark trail. And uh, so that's what keeps me fit. And then what keeps me happy is doing this a whole lot. I play guitar and sing rock and roll. I was in China and Taiwan recently and got to go in a studio and cut my first album. So, you know, that's, that's what I'm up to these days. That's, that's the... Uh, the sort of thing that, that keeps me going. Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, uh, <clears throat> clearly a man of many talents, and <laughs> I wish I could scratch the surface on a little bit of that talent. So welcome to the show. You Excited bet. to have you, and thanks for sharing what keeps you motivated every day. So our next guest, Jeff Seely. Jeff, Jeff is the, uh, my friend and partner. He is the CEO of Carew International, uh, which is one of the top sales uh, and service training companies in the world. And I've had the privilege of being able to uh, get an opportunity to get to know him. Uh, he's also been the driving force of the development of the Central Michigan University Nationally Recognized Professional Sales Program. Uh, and so if any of you guys who are raising up your children and want to send them to a sales program, you, you can, that's one of, the, one of the few that are in the nation that actually teach uh, business professionals how to be able to sell uh, and what does it mean to be a salesperson. So, Jeff, I'm super excited to have you. I know that you're also a contributing writer to Selling Power Magazine. You've been quoted in many different business journals uh, that are out there and industry journals. And if you want more information about Jeff and his organization, visit KRU, 
C-A-R-E-W.com. So Jeff, welcome to the show. And can you do me a favor? Can you share with our audience who, what, or how do you get inspired every single day? Jim shared all the things that he's doing on how he gets inspired. Tell us about you, Jeff. Well, you know, uh, thanks, Mario, and thanks, Jim and Mark, for letting me be a part of this. Uh, you know, I think the greatest thing that inspires me every day is when I was a, a young sales rep like Jim, um, I was in the consulting world, and it was really quite funny because one of the partners came up to me and said, basically, outside the fact you really don't develop great relationships, you don't really understand customer needs, and you're really a lousy closer, you really sell a lot of business. And so it kind of gave me the, uh, the incentive to go out and really start understanding more about sales. And so now, as I've uh, had the chance to spend time on the development side, I'm really just passionate every day about helping salespeople really do what this webinar is all about, how to become the CEO of their own business, how to, to raise the level, because for many years, uh, you know, when I went, we talked about Central Michigan, um, I was actually an accounting major. So how I wound up in the consulting side is I'm a failed accountant. And I was sitting there with them, it was the uh, chairman of the accounting department. And he said, boy, Jeff, you went to work for one of the, I'm an old guy, big eight firms. Now there's only four of them. But uh, he said, you went to the work for the big eight firms. What are you doing? Are you a partner there now or anything else like that? I said, no, no, actually I'm uh, doing sales and marketing for a large Fortune 500 company, and he stopped for a second. He goes, "Well, our more le our less successful graduates usually do go into sales and marketing," and I it kind of stopped me for a second about, "Wow, salespeople are just everywhere considered like these failures who couldn't do anything else and wound up somewhere else, but yet some of the smartest, brightest people I know are in sales, and so." For me, it's been a passion every day now with our organization and for me to wake up and try to figure out how to do a better job of helping people be better at what they are, which is being a professional salesperson and being that CEO and doing things for their, their customers that their customers never really thought were possible. That's awesome. Well, Jeff, we're excited to have you as part of the show here of Sales Chalk Talk. And uh, I know we've got some great insights, especially we talked about that in the pregame show. So I'm looking forward to some of your commentary. And last but not least, we've got the great, the wonderful, Mr. Mark Hunter, who's uh, welcome to the show. Mark is the sales hunter, uh, and he's actually been identified as one of the top 50 most influential sales and marketers uh, in the world. Uh, he's author of High Profit Prospecting and his newest book, which is Crushing It in the Marketplace, congratulations, Mark, which is High Profit Selling, Win the Sale Without Compromising on Price. Uh, so if you haven't seen that, uh, Mark, I don't know if you have a copy of it, but feel free to show it up, show it so people can actually see it. I knew you would have one. <laughs> High Profit Prospecting. Uh, so make sure you get a copy of that book. And if you can't find him on a webinar, you can probably see Mark speaking uh, at least minimum 50 times a year all over the world. In fact, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was talking to Mark and he was in Brazil <laughs> for just 32 hours. So Mark, welcome to the show. And did I miss telling it, the audience something about you? Uh, and last question is, is can you share with our audience who, what, or how you get inspired uh, to succeed every single day? Sure. Hey, thanks for mentioning the books. And actually, this is the current book, High, High Profit Prospect. And so, hey, that's the one you want to buy. But hey, I want you to buy the other one too. Anyway, but hey, you know what? It, it, I had a funny background getting into sales. I got into sales because of the Seattle Police Department. When I was in college, my last semester of college, I got three speeding tickets in the course of one semester, which led me really with a problem about six months later. I couldn't afford car insurance. I had three options, red truck driver, taxi cab driver, or salesperson. Well, I didn't want to get up at 2 a.m. to deliver bread. Wasn't going to do a taxi cab driver. So that left me with a sales job. And that's what actually got me going in sales, a career I had not thought about. So gee, just like some of our other guests. But you know what's interesting? You know what jazzes me? Is the ability to influence people every day. You know, I, what jazzes me is who I get to meet. Today, I happen to be in Chicago, and I'm, and I'm speaking at a supply chain um, conference, supply chain. You know, this is kind of the, the, this is who we in sales sell to, and I'm speaking to them here. Why? Because it gives me a chance to really learn, which is one of the things that also jazzes me, because when I get to learn more, I get to share more. When I get to share more, I get to learn more, and really, it's all about having fun with the people you come in contact with. Because my definition of sales is the definition of leadership. It's helping others see and achieve what they didn't think was possible. 
to me, that's cool. That's fun. I want to learn something new every day. That's awesome. Well, I know we're going to learn something new right now. So let's get into the second part of our segment here. Mark, Jim, Jeff, welcome to the show. And at any point in time, feel free to uh, reference any sites or books that you think might be valuable to our audience as well. And I want to start out with Jeff. Um, in, in, in our pregame discussion, if you would, uh, we spent some time talking with each other and I really enjoyed hearing Jeff's definition of the, uh, the question or the answer to this question is, what does the CEO of your business mean? What does the CEO, what does being the CEO of your business really mean? So Jeff, I'm going to start with you and then we're going to, we're going to take that around with uh, some of the other gentlemen here. So Jeff, take it away. What, what the heck does it mean to be the CEO of your own business when someone says it to a salesperson or if I'm a salesperson, I'm thinking, what does this mean? Well, Mario, thanks. I, re I really appreciate that. And this is something I really get passionate about when we start talking about being a, a sales professional, because a lot of times sales professionals sit there and think, well, my job is to sell my product or service. And I really look as the uh, as a sales professional is kind of what I, I would say the Peyton Manning of the offense. So their job is to how do they assess, marshal, implement all the resources of their organization to the customer and, and how are they accountable to the customer to help the customer's customer be better. And so you have to understand the strategy of the customer, which it's, it's more about, you know, not how your product's used, but what's the strategy? Um, what are they looking to accomplish? What's their, what's their long-term competitive advantage against the people that they're talking about? And the term I like to use is really become a proactive problem solver. And in order to do that, you also have to have multi-level relationships. And so a lot of times salespeople don't, as being the CEO, you have to have more than just your uh, you know, relationship with your current contact. You have to be in sales, marketing. You have to be in product engineering or product development or IT or whatever it is where your product affects is to get in the middle of that. And, and that's the thing I think that makes sales so exciting now and into the future is because that's a totally different game. It's no longer the Mad Men 3 martini and let's go to a baseball game or the sale. It's really getting an in-depth uh, knowledge of what your customer is all about and what they're doing and, and really providing the resources to help them uncover uh, and resolve problems that they may not know even existed. You caught me on mute there. Sorry. <laughs> good, good, good point there, Jeff. And it, it really ties well into the concept, like when I'm talking with a sales rep and I ask them, so, so what do you do? And they, and a salesperson says, Oh, I'm an account executive for, and I say, well, no, 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 no. What do you do? Well, I'm an account executive. What do, you, what do you mean? I'm a sales rep. I'm a BDR. I'm a sales developer. I'm, I'm a sales manager. No, no, no. What do you do? And that really comes back down to that, that concept of if you are the CEO, uh, you are going to talk about how you help organizations, uh, what, what business benefits you give back to an organization. And that's that fundamental mind shift change, I think, uh, between a sales rep and actually a business partner, how you actually are helping uh, organizations. And you can tell stories about that as well, uh, I, in, in my personal opinion. Well, you're exactly right, Mario. And it's interesting because one of our clients um, supplies to Apple. And when the iPhone first came out, uh, one of the biggest complaints about the iPhone glass was that it uh, you know, was smudged too much, your makeup was on it or whatever. And they weren't really involved in the development. They just, Apple was historically secretive about basically just saying, we need a piece of glass that's, you know, four inches wide and does this and this and this. Can you send it to us? And so they'd send them a thousand prototypes. And the, uh, the young man uh, who was involved with it started asking a whole bunch of questions about trying to get involved in the product development side. And once he figured out what the biggest issue was within Apple, he was able to tell them, if you just let me inside a little bit more, I can actually solve this problem so your biggest complaint goes away. And all of a sudden now they've had, you know, the, the lock on, app, on iPhones, iPads, um, iPods now for the last, you know, 10 years because of that. And it was a conversation he never dreamed of having until he started realizing that that's the only way he's going to solve this customer's problem. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that. Um, Jim, let's, let's jump to you because I know that you've got some thoughts on this particular um, uh, question as well. And, you know, the difference between CEO thinking and sales rep thinking on how you help your, your clients. I'd like to go back to the Peyton Manning reference that Jeff made just a second ago. Peyton Manning had one of the most impressive careers in football history. But he wasn't always with the same team. 
And the reason Peyton Manning had a wonderful career was not because of the team he was with. It was because of the commitment he made early in his career to become the person who would attract the future he wanted. That's a keeper. Become the person who would attract the goals that you want to achieve. That requires that you think like the owner of your own career, the owner of your own business, and you are currently under contract to the existing organization that is sending you the paychecks at the end of the month, okay? So you're, you're a business entity, and you might not have thought about yourself that way so far, but when you start thinking about yourself that way, then you start realizing, oh, I've got a vested long-term interest in my own reputation. Wow. My business and my personal reputation. I've got a, I, I should be more conscious of what I'm posting on Facebook and Twitter because that's part of the way the world sees me. And three years from now, I might get a job opportunity that's much larger within my own company or another one that's much larger than I'd ever thought of. And if I'm carrying some baggage into that new opportunity, I may lose the opportunity altogether. So that is a big deal. And the way I've put that, I'm having a little bit of trouble getting the system to allow me to, to make an entry here. Whenever I hit enter, it, it says uh, everyone is not in session. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, it says become the person who would attract the goals you seek. And I think that's the main thing. Um, there was one other thought I had a second ago, but it'll come back to me. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, well, let me, let me go to Mark because, Mark, we talked about this um, concept of think strategy rather than tactic um, as, a, as a salesperson. And I, I think this ties in really, really well with this, this particular topic here. Can you comment on that? Yeah, and, and I want to build on this whole thing about Peyton Manning and so forth and social media. If you think about it, your reputation precedes the value of your knowledge. You can be the smartest person out there. But if what you say is just not, oh, he's a village idiot or she's a village idiot, it's not going to be. See, your reputation, and if you think about it, what do leaders do? Leaders, leaders are in a position to influence and impact other people. And how do they do that? It's by thinking strategically. You know, Peyton Manning, let's just continue with this. He was a master because he could read defenses. But more importantly, he could read where defenses were going to be when he wanted to do what he wanted to do. And I think that's, the, that's when you are leading your own company, you have to be not looking at what's happening today, but what's going on two steps down the road. And you think about it, what's a good salesperson? A good salesperson is, is not just focused on the customer, but the customer's customer. That's how you really start thinking strategically. Yeah, those are some, those are some, uh, some great points. And, um, you know, when you talk about thinking strategically, you, there's this concept here about, the, the things that we have to do on an everyday basis to be able to move deals along, that's the tactical side of things. And then this more strategic visionary side of our, of our business. Can you comment on like, how do you balance that? Yeah. Well, here's a easy way that I can tell if a salesperson, when I'm working with a salesperson is strategic or tactic, are they asking the customer questions and the customer goes, great question. Now think about that for a moment. When the customer sits there and says, great question, what have you got? You've got a discussion going. That allows you to get to the next level. And that's really what it's all about because a good salesperson is not about just taking orders. No, no. A good salesperson is about creating incremental opportunities. It goes back to that original definition I said of, of helping others see and achieve what they didn't think was possible. That's what you're really trying to do as a salesperson. Yeah, that's a great point. And Jeff, uh, I'm going to come back to you and, and, and kickstart a, uh, this, keep this thought process going, um, teeing off of what Mark talked about, uh, which is starting this, this transformation of the thought process, the thinking process from um, your, your actions as well as your thinking to be a CEO of your own sales business. How do you, how do, you do it? What, what, is, what does a sales rep do in order to start thinking more strategically be able to close more business and what are the actions and steps they got to take? And then I want to get Mark and Jim's thoughts on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I really appreciate oh, and, what you And, and I'm sorry, Jeff, real quick, I didn't mean to uh, your train of thought just for all the audience to know. Uh, I actually was able to get Jeff inside of 
uh, the future. So he's speaking to us, I think like 14 hours or 15, eight, whatever it is, ahead of us in Australia at an airport. So if you hear background noise, it's because I was able to twist his arm, promise him a, a great, amazing steak to be on this call. Uh, and he's at 5.30 in the morning or something like that over there. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, 6 a.m. Friday. So I already know how all your Thursdays went for you salespeople out there and the sales professionals. Half of you are gonna make, have a great day today. You're going to have just unbelievable, so just, you know, I can't tell you which half, but I've just blown your minds. Half of you are going to have an unbelievable day today. Uh, anyways, the, uh, it's a great question in terms of, and I appreciate these guys all, you know, kind of thinking about the Peyton Manning aspect. And I really hate using sports analogies because half of our audience and, and that are, are females who are involved in the sales profession. But the idea behind, you know, what it takes is truly a mindset shift. And it, it, it takes moving your, your brain away from my product or service to my customer. And it really becomes this incredible customer focus. So as, as Mark said, it's you know, strategic. And Jim said, you know, wow, it's really how I think into the future. And, and both of them use the term I love to use is what, how are you going to impact your customer's customer? And if you just start with that mindset to start with, and, and I tell people, they're like, well, gosh, my product is just a piece of dust or a piece of plastic in an automobile or it's a you know it's five cents or something into the the total cost of whatever my customer is doing but it's amazing when you start thinking from the perspective if something goes wrong with that little piece what could happen and I kind of look at it as like a nice watch if you have an automatic watch and all of a sudden one little spring goes wrong or one little gear goes in that watch it no longer tells time and so you can Think about that from a business perspective. If a great sales professional has one intellectual curiosity about what their customers are doing and starts really thinking about how I can be more problematic in terms of my thought process for problem solving, all of a sudden it opens up a world and the resistance they sometimes get about, well, why do you want to meet this person or why do you want to be more networked goes away because what they've done is started focusing on the customer and the customer's customer as opposed to sitting there going, well, do you want to buy any more of this or do you need any more software? Or I have the greatest medical device in the world or pick a product. It doesn't matter. You know, we have customers who do things like distribution and, you know, talk about what could be a considered a non value added you know, position is so if I go in and just say, well, I don't make anything. All we do is distribute from here to here. But yeah, just think of all the impacts you can have in an organization uh, that go beyond what your, what your scope is. And so it's that mindset shift of, I'm not just a sales professional, I'm a business professional, and my job is to really help my customer be better every day at what they do. You know, Jeff, uh, I remember sitting inside of a meeting, um, this is with um, Randy Spratt. He was the former, he just retired last year, the former vice um, EVP, CIO, and CTO of McKesson Corporation. Uh, arguably one of the most powerful corporate American CIOs and CTOs uh, because McKesson was a fortune, a fortune 10 company. And early on in my career, he said to me when we sat down um, for one of our, um, our, our sales meetings, I got into his office and he said to me, Mario, it was one-on-one. -on -one. Let me give you a piece of advice. He said, when you come into an office such as mine, what I want you thinking about is I want you thinking about how you are going to make me more competitive than my competitors. And I think that is a, just a tremendous mindset thing. When I started thinking like that, and I, I know we talked about this in the pregame show, some of, the, some of your notes about making your customers better competitors in their markets, um, that when you start focusing that type of conversation, it really leads to winning type of arrangements. And you think the relationship goes to a different level in terms of making them more competitive and getting them better. Any, any thoughts on, on that? Let's, let's jump over to Mark. Uh, on either that concept, making your customers better competitors in the markets, or transforming your thinking and actions to be a CEO. Well, it's interesting. You know, what we're asking our customers to do is really what we need to be doing. Because really, how, how you know, one of the things that I, I challenge people every day is to say, okay, what did you learn today? And how are you going to use it tomorrow? And if you get into this mindset, you know, what did I learn today? And how am I going to use it tomorrow? Something I challenge parents, in fact, with their kids is to, is to challenge their kids to Google something every day, to learn something new every day. And if you think about this, if I can learn something new every day, 
and then in turn share that with somebody else. That makes me more advantageous to other people. Because again, you look at that seat, you, you know, you look at that person, you, you were sitting in that person's, he's only going to allow people into his office who he trusts, who he views, he can have confidence in, and he can have competence in. In other words, it's people who come in and, and share with them insights that he can't get somewhere else. That's our goal. That's our goal. Yeah, great. Jim, any um, thoughts on that, on this topic? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was just remembering when I had an office in La Jolla, California. We're in Thousand Oaks now, up uh, Ventura County. Uh, I've been a professional speaker for 40 years, and, and I've had various sized staff throughout that time, as many as 10 people, as few as just one. And there was one time when I had a pretty good sized staff for me, and over our copier machine, I had our mission statement. Our mission is to develop and effectively market an ever-improving line of top quality products and services designed to enhance business people's effectiveness in sales, management, and customer relations. Great mission. That would get you an A in mission statement class, right? Because it started with two. It defined the target. It told how. It involved all the stakeholders. Good job on the mission statement. One day after it had been there for months, I asked Susie, who was my assistant, what's our mission? You know, just spot uh, uh, test. What's our mission? And Susie said, I don't know. <laughs> and I said, sure you do. She said, you mean the thing over the copy machine? I said, yeah, it's hanging over the copier so you'll see it every single day. What is it? She said, I don't know, it's too long. Ah, it's too long? Okay, it meant something to me meant something to all of us in the dialogue we had, the long process we went through to come up with the mission statement at a planning retreat, but it lost all life from that day forward, okay? So I went back to the thinking, the think tank, and came at it from a very different point of view, and I came up with a new one that I posted the next day. It said, our mission, make life better for people, dot, 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 profitably. Now you might say, well, oh, you had to throw in profitably. Well, excuse me, a business that doesn't turn a profit either better go non-profit and get some donors, which is a form of profit, or you have to stop doing the good that you're able to do. So how do you, how do you get the opportunity to do good for people? Make a profit. And the more profit you make, the more people you can help. So the purpose of our business is to make somebody's life better. I make her life better because I implement a, a system that saves all kinds of wasted resources and saves time. Okay, I, I made his life better because I got him the information he needed earlier than the other people would have gotten it, and it gave him a competitive edge. I made their life better because we installed our equipment, and now things work reliably for a long period of time, regardless of the weather or the size of the workload. I made his life better because I got him to the airport on time in my Uber car, right? So how do you make life better for people? We need to be really, really strategically, I mean, surgically specific about how the behaviors and, and actions we take make someone's life better and then focus on doing that more and more every day because I'm the owner of this sales business and I've got to make me worth more to my company long before I can expect my company to start paying me more. You know, I, I tell people, if you want a raise, give your customer a raise through your behavior, your performance. Give your employer a raise through being such a great contributor, right? Then you'll get a raise. If you don't, find another benefactor. But give them a raise first. That's the way you get your payback. That's great. Great feedback. Mark, you, you actually, in our, in our pregame show, we talked a little bit about this as well, but uh, on that same thought concept about how you're going to give back, how you're going to help. Um, you said something to me, which was never forget your role is to help others develop their skills and achieve results they didn't think were possible. Um, and that the strength of the team is not just on you, it's what you're able to get out of others. Talk, talk a little bit about that and how that, that applies here as a salesperson and how you can apply that. Yeah, because too many salespeople view their customer as the enemy. And what I want to do is I want, I want to view the customer as part of my team. I'm on their team. We're on the same team. 
So my objective is just as what Jim said, hey, I got to give my customer a raise. That's how I become worth more. That's how I give myself a raise. And that's what it's all about. How do I help my customer do something better? How do I help them become more effective? How do I help them see more insights? Because what's interesting is, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. And, and one of the, it, it's a very basic observation, but, you know, it's amazing how millionaires and or anybody of substantial knowledge, they hang around with other people with substantial knowledge. So, you know, if you want to be seen as a leader, you got to do actions that are a leader because then you'll be attracted to leaders. And, and what happens is your customers then begin behaving as a leader. And it's amazing when both you and your customers are acting as behavior, you know, as leaders. It's amazing how that changes the quality of the conversation. It changes the value of the meeting. It changes just the whole outcome and where I can get to tomorrow with everybody else I come in contact with. Yeah, good point. Jeff, any um, additional thoughts on, on this particular topic? Sorry, I'd unmute myself here. I, you're about to hear that the uh, flight to Dubai is leaving shortly. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, uh, you know, I think as, as Jim and Mark said, and you've said, Mario, overall, it, it's just amazing to me that the number of sales professionals who have difficulty transform transforming their, their process to this. And, you know, part of the thing I'm really trying to understand or research a little bit right now is, is that a company, you know, culture that creates that or is it a sales rep culture? And it's really shocking. People in general love to be successful, but yet the simple little habits they have to do that Jim talked about, uh, they don't do. They think it, it comes easy. And the days of a sales rep job kind of being an easy job, quite frankly, are gone. And the easy sales rep jobs are going to disappear even faster because the knowledge required, the skills required to do that um, are going to be totally different now than in the next 10 years. And, and I laugh, I've, I've been hanging around a while, as, as all of us have. And I think the sales profession has transformed more in the last 10 years than in the previous 30 because of what the requirements are. So I really think people need to just think from a perspective of I'm really in a professional job and to be in that professional job, I've got to practice. I've got to do things differently than what I used to do. And it's like asking any great athlete, great performer, uh, you know, Jim's playing music for us and talking about recording. He just doesn't pick up a guitar every day and uh, think, well, you know what, I'm going to record. He's got to practice. He's got to try things. He's got to do things differently. He's got to, you know, understand his voice and how does his voice best work with his music and all those things happen and that same phenomenon has to happen in the sales profession to be really good. And so let's, let's uh, transition into practical steps that as a sales leader, I can help my sales team do this, which is start thinking differently. Um, you know, I was recently talking to a sales rep and I, and I mentioned to them earlier, I mentioned this earlier, but I'll, I'll give a more specific example. What do you do? And they, they said they, they sell, um, um, uh, well, <laughs> how about, how about we'll just go this route that, that, uh, they, they did not specifically identify how they actually help folks. And they were so focused on, um, how they have to deliver on selling X, the widget or the service because they're under a pressure of quota. And that that's all the things that the sales leaders are focused on, on is have you met your number? Have you met your number? What are you doing? How many people have you called? How many emails have you sent out? How many appointments do you have? Right. Which has become very problematic in the industry in terms of our, our sales community, our leaders really focusing on this, the, the productivity and forgetting all about the strategy piece. So, so let's take a step back here. So we have a lot of sales leaders who are on this call. You're a sales leader. What do we tell them on things they can do as a, on a practical day over day basis, as well as more overarching over quarter over quarter that can help their teams perform better and actually reach the minds of their buyers and solve business problems. And let's go ahead and start with uh, Mark. Sure. I think one of the, one of the first things you can do is challenge your people to be asking your customers questions that they don't have the answer to, and you don't have the answer to too easy that salespeople want to walk in and convey the same information that the customer can get on the internet. If you do that, you will be replaced. And if, you, if you're not replaced today, you'll be replaced tomorrow. You just haven't gotten the email. What I want to do is I want to go in and ask the customer questions that they can't answer. That gets me to a level of dialogue. 
that's probably the single biggest thing that I think any uh, sales manager can do with their people and any good sales person should do. Now, here's the other piece. When I get done with that, I want to be asking myself, what did I learn? What did I learn from that customer? And how do I parlay that over to some other customer? Because not only do I want every piece of information I learned to help me with that customer, but how does every piece of information I learned help me with some other customer? Then I have really what I call exponential value from the information I learned. That's a great point. Jim, thoughts? Yes, as a matter of fact, that when you think about making a sales call and what difference does it make to think as an owner, if you go in as a typical salesperson, you will go in there as a supplicant. You know, oh, please, may I have some of your time? Oh, please, would you consider my product? Can I have just a little bit longer to tell you more? Oh, no, 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 don't give me it in the projection, you know. I, I need, no, that's operating from weakness. Go in there as a fellow business owner. Maybe their business is worth millions and yours is worth hundreds. Doesn't matter. You're a business owner. You deserve to think of yourself with respect and respect them as well and treat them accordingly. Defer to their knowledge and their advanced uh, position, their advanced skills, whatever. But don't become subordinate to them in your own mind and feelings. You need to be able to sit down with someone and, and talk about the things that matter to them. And that means you're not going in there to tell them about your product. It's not even important whether you tell them about your product or service What's in, until later in the process. What's important is that you connect with them in such a way that they see you as a solution source. You know, one of the things I've been able to do over the years, I've been, as I mentioned, I've been a professional speaker and trainer for 40 years. And you mentioned that I've written 18 books. So I've got a lot of mileage in doing all this. But early in my career, I, I found that as I traveled, I would frequently run into famous people. Some of them were business famous, you know, like a Jack Welch or a, uh, Steve Jobs or somebody like that. Not that I met them. But um, some were business famous and some were celebrity famous or, or you know, they were someone I admired, you know, like uh, Annette Bening on one flight or, or uh, um, uh, I'll think of her name in a minute, but a, a, a wonderful singer on another flight, Roger Miller. Remember him, the singer from years ago? I saw him one day, and I, I thought everyone who approaches these people goes up to him and says, "Oh, Mister or Ms. So and So, I love you. Oh, I'm such a fan. Oh, could I get a signature? Whatever." I just said, "I'm not going to do that. I will approach them as a peer." who admires their work. And so when I would see them, I would, I would say good morning, you know, instead of, oh, you know, Mario, I've, I've been following you for a hundred years. I would say good morning. And Mario would typically say good morning and say, I really admire your work. Thanks for what you're doing. And then I just go on about my business. Invariably, if we were close to each other in seating, they would eventually turn to me and ask a question or, make a comment or just treat me as if I was just a normal person in their world instead of some intruder that's going to eat up all their time. Like yesterday, literally yesterday at lunch here in Westlake Village, California, I was sitting with a friend and at the next table was John Fogarty of Credence Clearwater. And uh, I thought, gosh, I want to go over there and talk with John Fogarty. This is so cool. I want to talk. And I look and I thought, just not going to be appropriate. And if I do go over there, it's going to come off the wrong way. So I just waited until he got up to leave. And I said, excuse me, John, really appreciate the music. Thank you. And then I went on back to what I was doing. And he was smiling as he walked away. And so that's thinking like a, a peer, thinking like a business owner. And, and that's a huge thing in those opening moments of every sales contact. That's great. You know, as uh, and Jeff, I'm going to come back to you in just a second here. But I, I was introduced to a CEO uh, of a fairly good size, mid sized company um, who was having a struggle. And um, a mutual friend of mine uh, said, you know, sent an email and said, Hey, I think you guys should talk. So uh, he set up a call. And one of the things that I think is very important if you want to start thinking like a CEO is uh, we, we sell social selling training and sales training. 
I don't go in and saying, hey, what are you doing with your LinkedIn profiles? I don't go in and say, hey, how are you guys doing employee advocacy? I don't go in and talk about, uh, you know, are you using LinkedIn Sales Navigator? <laughs> right? Now, those are the tactics that we help enable, right? We got on the phone call and part of my pre-call plan, my pre-call plan, I had two questions. What is the problem that triggered this phone call? Number one. Number two, what are you doing to fix it? And what that helped me understand is, is one, what was the problem that he was really trying to come uh, to, 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 to me on? And number two, I wanted him to admit that he didn't have a solution to the problem, thus the reason why you're talking to me, right? And that was a beautiful conversation that we had, uh, and it really helped to continue on with uh, now further discussions with hopefully a much larger engagement. So one of the things I recommend to salespeople and sales leaders, before your salesperson picks up the phone for their next call, face-to-face, -face, uh, audio conference, whatever it is, ask them, what are the two questions that you're going to ask that will help you understand the pain as well as what they're trying to do to fix the problem? So those are two things that, that, that I've got in terms of practical uh, steps. Jeff, if, you, if you're good to talk and you don't have any background noise, um, uh, feel free to comment on, on some of those practical things that a sales leader can help do. Yeah, and I think you're, you're on the right track is one of the things that if you look at a sales leader is oftentimes we spend a lot of times in the metrics of things and sales leaders have gone from being leaders to managers, quite honestly, or almost administrators. And they're looking at the scorecard saying, okay, you know, Jim, you're standing here, Mark, you're standing there, Mario, you're standing there, Jeff, you're standing there. And they really don't get into what is it they're going to do differently to help their people think differently. And so we get this thirst for, you know, what are we doing today? And it goes along exactly that, is you have to think of yourselves as an equal when you walk in. And most times when people get into that CEO moment, so to speak, or C-level moment, the first thing they do, it's like they want a speed date, but they don't really want to learn anything about the date. So they just want to tell them all the great things why you should date me, because I feel like I'm going to have this you know, one, two minute opportunity to sell myself and then walk away. And I always joke, the best piece of advice I ever got was literally from my grandmother, which said this simply this, uh, you have two ears and one mouth, use them in proportion. So when you're in front of that person, it's having those couple great questions and please, please, whatever you do, do not use what keeps you up at night because you, know, you don't want to know that <laughs> you don't, and you don't care. And that's like the most canned thing. And I, I've heard that so many times when I'm out in the field, it's like someone will sit down they'll be with the C-level person and they'll have you know, myself or someone from our team there. And the first thing they'll say is, so what keeps you up at night, Mark? And you know, Mark may say, insomnia, I got to go to the bathroom three times a night, whatever it is. And, 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 but it's really a, it's like a canned question. So now it becomes, what are the barriers to your success? What is your competition doing that's troubling you? Uh, what, are the, what are your customers looking for that's out there? Is there a disintermediation in your business that's going on right now? Because at the end of the day, you're an expert at what you do. And I, you know, we have people who, are, who work with Amazon and Amazon is obviously an unbelievable business, but they sell packaging to Amazon and they really get intimidated. And I said, what is Amazon an expert at? When Amazon is an expert at distribution, what are you an expert at? You're an expert at packaging. How can you impact the customer experience for Amazon more than what Amazon can? Because what's the customer looking for? They're looking for when that package shows up, is it properly packaged? Is there stuff on damage? What's it look like if it, uh, you know, when you open it? And I always joke, you know, a lot of people buy Louis Vuitton stuff. Look at the packaging of a Louis Vuitton bag. It's beautiful. But why is it beautiful? Because it matches the customer experience that they're expecting. And that happens, I use packaging. That happens in everything that our customers do, every one of us. So that's, that's what you need to kind of be thinking about. It's like, how am I influencing and how can I understand strategically what's really, really bothering them and, and worrying them? I, lo uh, I love it. That's some, some great advice there, Jeff. Uh, we've got, we're running out of time here. So I'm going to switch to Mark. And we've got a lot of questions. Uh, I've got literally about 45 questions in queue here. And I want to, this, this one pops out at me here, Mark, in terms of the question. And I want to get your thought on that. You've got about uh, two minutes here. 
to to give an answer. And if you take up less time, that's okay. We'll we'll we'll, we'll move on to uh, add, give uh, some time for somebody else. But the question is is how do you sell the concept of being the CEO to your sales organization without intruding on corporate guidelines? Um, and I think that's an interesting uh, uh, thought, thought there. So Mark, take it away. Yeah, because regardless of whatever your title is, you want to be seen as the CEO in your organization. Now, what does that mean? You've got to create a culture of leadership. And what what are the components of that? It's integrity and trust. And if you really think about it, integrity and trust are really one in the same. But if you stop and think about this, what are the insights and how are you helping others? You know, there's an old expression, if being a servant is below you, then being a leader is above you. And if you really stop and think about that, a good CEO is one who is serving others. What does that mean? Serving people inside the company and serving people outside the company. One of the biggest differences I can tell between an average salesperson and a great salesperson, the great salesperson takes responsibility for everything. They're not throwing other departments under the bus. They're out with a customer and they throw somebody else under the bus. Great CEOs don't throw departments under the bus. No, they take responsibility. So really you have to create this, this culture that says, I'm going to be responsible. I'm going to be in control and I'm going to do this with a level of trust and integrity bringing out the best in other people. And how do I do that? By allowing other people to, su to succeed, even at my own expense. I love that answer, that's great. Uh, we got uh, 60 seconds here. Jim, I'm gonna throw this back to you. Uh, if you take 30, then we can give uh, 30 seconds to Jeff here. But here's a question. I'm in a slump mm -hmm. in sales. How do I keep myself motivated as a CEO? The main thing is make contact. Anytime you're in a slump, make more contacts, reach out. Uh, anytime you are feeling uh, depressed, get up off the couch, walk outside the door, uh, say hello to anyone, pick up a piece of trash. See, what activates us is a sense of purpose. Anytime we see, anytime we do something, we start to feel a connection with the meaning of it. Like if you're holding the door open for someone, you feel a little bit more generous. Fact is you're being more generous, but you feel it too. So it affects you. If, if a person were clinically depressed and went to a psychiatrist and said, what should I do? The psychiatrist would often answer anything, anything, paint basketballs blue, uh, collect armadillos. I don't know, seconds, you know, yeah, that sort of thing. So take action. Take action. Love it. Jeff. I'll give you 30 seconds. If you've got 30 seconds, what should I do? I'm in a slump. Yep. Uh, it, it's, it's, you gotta, you, you know, you mentioned get off the couch. It's, you have to engage and sales be great people when they're, you know, if you're a Oh, did we lose them? Or is that my connection? He froze up. He got like frozen. Yeah. He got frozen. Okay. Yeah. Well, that having date, been said, date got, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> sales chalk talk. We ended on a frozen moment. <laughs> I'm excited to have you guys with me. Uh, Jim Cathcart, uh, cathcart.com. Is that correct? If that's what they want to get a hold of you. That's correct. And, uh, Mark Hunter, the sales hunter.com. Is that correct? And for Jim, uh, Jeff Seeley, um, kru.com. Feel free to connect with any of these individuals on LinkedIn. Watch these fine gentlemen. They are amazing. They are awesome. And tune in for our next sales chalk talk, which won't be till January because M3 Junior Growth Strategies is going to Hawaii for the entire month of December. So uh, you guys have a great rest of the day. Thanks for joining us. And Mark, Jim, and Jeff, you guys have been awesome. Thank you for joining. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Great telling.